So I would like to start the first speaker, Professor Dr. Ahmed Gindi, Maswan Heart Center. Dr. Ahmed will give us how to manage complications in CTO PCI. Thank you, Professor Hadidi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. So whenever someone is asked to give a complications talk, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. I hope uh, it doesn't mean we're causing too much complications ourselves. So if we can get the slides up, that would be fantastic. Yep. And I probably needed some training. Not sure how to use this, but I assume this is how it goes. So these are my disclosures to get them out of the way. So this is how we look at uh, complications during CTO PCI. You have a number of uh, coronary related complications uh, they're related to acute vessel closure, which can have a number of mechanisms. Uh, we have perforations, one of the most dreaded complications, equipment entrapment or loss. There are non-coronary complications, which is usually related to a coronary event but sometimes hypotension can be simply because of hypovolemia, can be because of pump failure, can be because of uh, uh, a power position of an AL1 causing AR that goes unnoticed. But MI, arrhythmias, and death, they are usually related to a coronary complication, but we label them as non-coronary. And there are the non-cardiac complications which are inherent to a long and complex procedure rather than uh, CT or PCI per se. So there can be vascular access complications, thromboembolic complications, contrast-induced nephropathy, radiation skin injury, and stroke. But uh, here I highlighted sort of, I mean, all of those complications, if left undetected and untreated in due time, they can lead to death. But the most common are those highlighted in red. So the, the most common means by which a patient can, you can actually end by life loss is donor vessel injury, which is one of the most important things in CTO PCI that you want to recognize early on and treat, and it takes the upper hand. Um, it's usually very good practice to give and advisable to leave a safety wire in your donor vessel. Side branch occlusion, which can happen uh, with a variety of mechanisms. Thrombus, and this is why we emphasize the need to monitor your ACT regularly. Every 25 to 30 minutes, keep it above 300 for anti-grade CTO PCI and above 350 for retrograde procedures. And perforation, which obviously leads to tamponade, is, uh, I would say, the second most common cause of lethal complications during CTO PCI. Now, if you look at the event rate during CTO PCI, the, it hovers around 3%. These are different registries and series that you can look at. And the, the reassuring thing that the success rate is invariably above 85%, um, and that's procedural success in dedicated CTO programs. Uh, but you can still see that the numbers, when you get into the complication side, are definitely far from being negligible and are also higher than uh, conventional or non-CTO PCI. Uh, can we predict complications? Perhaps the easiest way is the progress CTO complication score, which takes into account patient age, any patient above 65, that's a strong predictor of an adverse event, long CTO segments, more than 23 millimeters, and the use of retrograde approach, we all know, is associated, is associated with around a three-fold increase in the major adverse event rate. Given the, the time constraints, it's going to be difficult to address all those complications, so perhaps I'll focus on one of the most dreaded complications in the cath lab, perforations. They're relatively uncommon with regular PCI, but with CTO PCI, it's much higher, can cause tamponade and up to 30%, and mortality is not just related to the acute event. There is a mortality, an increase in mortality rate that you can notice after a perforation causing a tamponade that sort of goes or covers the first 30 days, and this is probably, probably related to the hemodynamic sequelae of a tamponade, uh, the use of blood products, and uh, sort of a systemic inflammatory response that uh, ensues. The risk increases with age, with diabetes, with post-cabbage patients, with the use of rotation atherectomy or cutting balloons, and in CTO PCI indeed. When we focus on CTO PCI, they're actually common in up to 25% of cases 
we will push a wire outside the vessel architecture. But the, the good thing is wires alone hardly ever cause a problem. So tamponade occurs in 0.3%. Uh, this rises to 1.3% with retrograde CTO PCI. And the 30-day mortality is high. It's, it hovers around 15%. Again, for the sake of time, you're, you're familiar with the Ellis classification to categorize the severity or grade the severity. The best thing is to have a quick look at one of the patients, a relatively young lady, EF of 20% with a scarred LCX territory, and the videos are... Anyway, so you can see for the sake of time, this was a very short uh, uh, CTO of the LED. I'm not sure why this is freezing, but anyway. Um, and you can see that we fixed the right coronary artery. There was a quick anti-grade wire escalation for the LED. Some balloon dilatations didn't work. Rotational atherectomy. You can see we have a retrograde dissection extending into the ostium of the circumflex. Two stents later, and voila. So this is one of the worst perforations I've come across uh, during my work. And the first thing you want to do is tamponade the bleeding. And you can see that we removed the wire in the circumflex and quickly advanced it to the diagonal branch. So now we can block and deliver, as we call it. So we leave the balloon inflated, deflated only when the covered stent is in place. And this is a covered stent put just distal to the origin of the circumflex. And given that the circumflex was scarred, we thought about leaving it alone, but the, the patient had worsening mitral regurgitation. So we just crossed and put a, a T-stent or another stent in T configuration. So with coronary perforations, this is sort of the mindset we have. You need immediate balloon inflation. You want to prepare for blood products, IV fluids and presses of the hemodynamics demand so, pericardiosynthesis if in tamponade. Um, you might want to consider autotransfusion and you want to notify your surgeon. And importantly, you want to do all those steps almost simultaneously. Now, with large vessel perforations, prolonged balloon inflation or covered stents usually do the job. With distal vessel perfs, uh, you can consider prolonged balloon inflation, embolization with coil or fat, and use a covered stent. Uh, you might cross or stent across that branch if it were uh, something not supplying a large uh, segment of the myocardium. Importantly, we do not give protamin until all the gear is out. Otherwise, you'll be dealing with a double jeopardy where you're dealing with a perf on the one hand and uh, thrombosis on your gear on the other hand. Um, we also do not give heparin after the procedure for the first 6 to 12 hours. And those are definitely not patients for same-day discharge. You want to keep them monitored for 24 hours. So again, for the sake of time, you're pretty much familiar with that. In the old days, we used to um, almost invariably, invariably utilize uh, a ping-pong technique because the available graft master was just too bulky to be delivered with a balloon in the same guiding cath. So I think nowadays, even in the US, with the Papyrus PK approved, and this is not working, guys. Sorry for that. It would have helped if we had a keyboard. And we crashed. So uh, nowadays in Egypt, we have uh, more than one option. Uh, this patient had a Bentley covered stent. It's a low profile stent where you can deliver, um, you can use a, in a six French guiding catheter, you can use up to a 3.5 balloon and a 3.5 uh, uh, covered stent in the same guiding catheter without having to resort to a ping pong technique. Um, I think in the US now with the PK papyrus approved, there are also options beyond the, the particularly bulky graft master. One good iteration from the, from the Bentley and the PK papyrus is they now have a 5-0 stent, which wasn't the case when they were first on the market. Thank you very much. No, we haven't finished them. No, I haven't finished. I'm just I'm, I'm thanking the IT guys, the technical guys. So we'll, so this was, so with this perforations, you want to make sure that you're conscious where your polymer jacketed and stiff wires are situated. We always exchange for a workhorse wire before balloon angioplasty. Use trapping techniques rather than a hydraulic method for removal of your microcatheter. And remember that knuckles, 
they're very safe, yes, and we always trust the knuckle, but if you push a knuckle too far into the distal part of a branch or a side branch, you can perforate distally. Now, this is the same patient six hours later, and the, what we need to remember is PTFE has uh, a degree of recoil. So we want to make sure when you deliver your stents that they're are usually upsized by 0.25 or 0.5 millimeters compared to the stent, uh, regular stent I put in previously, and make sure you do high pressure post dilatation. Now with epicardial collaterals, and again for the sake of time, we'll move quickly. This is a patient with a, a circumflex CTO, an osteo circumflex CTO, with a stent ex extending from the left main, into, from the LED into the left main. And we failed to achieve any progress anti-gradely, so you see we're going via this uh, relatively small and tortuous epicardial collateral. That was a sign black wire that uh, was maneuvered quite smoothly actually into the, uh, the circumflex. We, we did a tip in to avoid putting too much tension on such a fragile collateral. And we finished by uh, opening up the circumflex, putting a couple of stents. But you can appreciate that there is, at that acute bend, there's a, a tiny perforation. And with epicardial collaterals, we do not leave any perforations behind. You want to go out when the bleeding has stopped because they can continue. This is a very mobile part of the heart. These are very fragile vessels. They can continue to leak overnight and they call you at 2 a.m. in the morning with a tamponade. So you want to leave the lab with, with those controlled. This was controlled by three fat emboli delivered through uh, the sternpike microcatheter and you can see the final result. We also want to make sure that those collaterals are not bleeding from either sides. So this was the, the check injection from the left side as well. Uh, more epicardial perforations. Again, uh, a very short uh, circumflex CTO, but circumflex can be tricky indeed. So we fixed the LED with uh, uh, two stents after rotational atherectomy, and to our surprise, we were unable to open up that CTO anti-gradely, again shifted retrogradely via a very tiny collateral from the right coronary artery. The problem it connects at the very distal cap, which, which usually causes a bit of a problem. And you can see how mobile this part of the heart is. So while we were trying to control our cyan black, we lost the system and we have a perforation. So that's probably the worst scenario you have. You have a perf and an epicardial collateral and you lost your wire. Uh, we were lucky to be able to maneuver a SO3 wire across the perforation again. Uh, then we just advanced the microcatheter and left it in place to sort of seal any bleeding while we figure out what we want to do. We were able to use the distal wire as a marker and work anti-gradely, but while we were doing our balloon dilatations, we had another perforation in the body of the circumflex. So this was a trial to control the bleed with a prolonged balloon inflation. It didn't work. And we ended up putting a 2.5 uh, graft stent in the circumflex proper. And now we fixed the, 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 um, the perforation in the epicardial collateral with fat embolization. And because this is such a tiny segment and you have a covered stent on the other side, we didn't think that injecting the fat would be a good idea. It can lead to just further rupture of the epicardial collateral. So this was a medical 12 wire pushing the fat embolus in. And one useful trick to use is a suction collapse where you just uh, hook up the microcatheter to an indeflator and apply negative pressure. That occasionally leads to collapse of the bleeding uh, epicardial altogether. So with, with epicardials, we don't surf. We usually, we always check backflow before tip injection. With very tortuous or uh, uh, very vulnerable or small epicardial collaterals, try to avoid externalization and shift to one of the tip-in maneuvers. And uh, caution regarding epicardial collaterals in patients with previous cardiac surgery, perforation can be lethal and is virtually unaccessible uh, to us with the regular pericardial synthesis routes. They need CT guided thoracosynthesis, which is not usually within our skill set. You want to embolize from both ends and suction collapse can be very helpful and you don't check with the tip injection once you're done. I'll just ask for two more minutes if you don't mind. Uh, very important is you need to have the 
proper gear and you need to know how to use them. So the, the Azure uh, 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 coils are very good, but they need a peripheral type microcatheter for delivery. What we have in our cath lab, in our cath lab is one of the neurovascular coils which can be delivered through your conventional coronary microcatheter. So this is an algorithm uh, for how you block epicardial collaters. The important thing is you want to block them from both ends because they can bleed from either side. Uh, fat versus coils, fat is universally available. Uh, problem is you don't see it. The delivery is not as controlled as detachable coils and uh, they are occasionally very challenging to get in. This is a, a, a video from Manos's uh, YouTube channel. Remember that fat floats. Some microcatheters have their hubs, they're relatively wider, so they're easier to load up fat into. You want to get pure yellow fat rather than fat with shreds of, with shreds of subcutaneous tissue because that makes the loading difficult and it's not compressible as fat globules. Suction collapse can be helpful, remember that. So I'll skip septal perforations. They're usually uh, self-limited. You can see this is a patient with an LED CTO and this microcatheter just prolapsed causing uh, a septal tear. And you can see that the final result, this is a hematoma within the septum. While I usually do not coil those, but the important thing is to make sure you continue to follow up those patients because those uh, fat emboli can be uh, lethal on some occasions. This is a, a, a case report some years ago from Khaldun and his group. And the patient eventually had an enlarging septal hematoma that led to his death uh, four days later despite being put on an ECMO. So to wrap up, it's important to remember that there are five stages of grief. This is uh, one of the landmark uh, uh, books on uh, dealing with death. But remember that denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance is the sort of mindset you go through whenever you're faced with a disaster in the cath lab. And what you, you, you need to do is really move very quickly from across all those five stages to the stage of acceptance and action. And this is how we think about how we can prevent and manage complications with CTO, PCI. A is prevention, quick recognition and acceptance followed by action. Call for help. Uh, Four eyes are usually better than two. Make sure you have the proper bailout equipment in your lab and you want to make sure you know how to use them beforehand. The worst thing is to try to figure out how a detachable coil system works during the heat of the moment. And without the proper audit, you'll just continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. So this is a paper we just published on how to prevent and manage different challenges and complications during CTO PCI. I think uh, it, it can be useful for those of you wanting further reading. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed, for this uh, great demonstration, the, how to deal with complications, and very nice, to, uh, especially if you have, uh, I, I, I saw you, I know that you are using coils, uh, no problem, a lot, but uh, it's a good I option. hope not a lot, but yes, I'm using them. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Not a lot. Uh, I mean, Yanni, that you are accustomed to use uh, coins, but uh, I saw you that you are using fat, em fat embolism. Is, uh, did, did this depend on the site where you are working, or that uh, uh, depends you don't have coins in the, the other, not in your cast lab, I know, but in other cast labs you are working. So uh, what do you think? So yes, when we, f when we first started having those sorts of complications, they were not CTO PCI related, so we had to experiment with fat because we simply did not have coils in our lab. And the first couple of times, it just hit us that this is uh, very appealing theoretically, but different, difficult to apply. Um, and once we got used to them, we also started appreciating that with very large perfs, or big epicardial collaterals, they don't usually work as much as coils do. So the next step was to make sure we have coils on the table. It doesn't come in handy when you're working in a lab that does not have coils, although this is not advisable. But yes, I think fat being universally available, it's a, it's a very useful trick to have up, have up your sleeve to know how to utilize fat for uh, embolization. Ahmed, I think any the preparation for cast lab for C2O, I think um, the cast lab must be prepared for the complicated case before the simple case. Yeah, and the uh, equipment, the 
الموضوع مش 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 وايرز اند اند مايكرو كاسترز موضوع ان انت لازم تو بريبير يور سيلف فور كومبليكيشن يعني قصه تو بي كيب تو بيكم ا سيتي اومان لايك بروفيسور جندي لايك بروفيسور عمرو حديدي لايك بروفيسور عادل اتريبي يو ماست ليرن هاو تو ديل وذ ذا كومبليكيشن بيفور يو ديل وذ ذا سيمبل كيس ابسولوتلي يس وات وي سو فروم ان ايكونوميك بيرسبكتيف there's usually the concern that what if I get uh, 25 cover stents with different sizes and they get expired. Uh, I think this is an investment very well placed. And the best thing, as a matter of fact, is that they do expire by the end of the year and you throw them away. Yeah. But this is not a waste of money. This is going to save a life. As long as you're working, you're bound to get into those complications. And the best thing is to have the bailout equipment but never have to use them. Yes, وفي uh, حاجه امبورتنت uh, uh, يعني احمد قالها انا بشكره طبعا المحاضره الجميله uh, ان يعني في الجرافت ستنس الجرافت ستنس لما بي لما بتعمل لهم هاي بريشر ذا ماكسيمم دي اكسباند از 0.2 0.25 بينما الاستنتات نفسها اللي احنا بنحطها دي اكسباند باي 0.4 تو 0.5 فلو انت حاطط ستنت وحصل بيرفوريشن يو هاف تو يوز ا بيجر سايز جرافت uh, كاستر which is very important وقالها احمد يمكن يمكن خدتوش بالكم منها شويه انا حبيت بس تو ابريت اون ذس ذس از فيري امبورتنت ان انت تو يوز ذا بروبر سايز اوف ذا جرافت كاستر 0.25 مور ذان ذا اوريجينال ستنت ما هي المشكله يا دكتور عادل في في السمول ستنت اللي هي 2.5 لما نيجي ندخل الجرافت ستنت الجرافت ستنت البروفايل بتاعها ممكن ما يسمعش ان احنا نخش بلارجر جرافت ستنت The, 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 2.75 هو مش لارجر. Current yeah. generation they yeah. actually have a very good. يعني كان كان عندي كيس لسه من اسبوعين بورفريتد بيست ليفت كومبلكس و2.5 ستنت الجرافت ستنت 2.8 كانت بس البروفايل بتاعها فعلا مش زي البروفايل بتاعت الاستنتات ال Absolutely correct but we're lucky to have better iterations nowadays compared to the good old graft master. Yeah. Uh, they still aren't, they don't have the profile definitely of a regular uh, DES, thin strut DES, but they're much better than what we used to work with in the old days. Yeah, Perhaps our colleagues from the US can, can give us some insight because I think until last year, they only had the graft master yeah. approved by FDA. Yeah, يعني الكلام ده دكتور عادل ممكن يكون صح في اللارج فيزل، اما انا السمول في الديستال فيزل الجرافت ستنت البروفايل بتاعها ما بيساعدش انها توصل مور ديستال في في, في سمول so. ستنت. So also we use, uh, in some cases, I use the gel foam. Uh, some, you know that the, the radiotherapist sometimes using yes. uh, this gel foam in the cast lab to include the feeding vessels for tumors and something. And I uh, try to, I, I show a cases like this with, uh, uh, to take small parts of this gel foam and put it into the microcaster and you can uh, put it distally. And I think sometimes- These are very good for distal perforations indeed, but I don't have experience with them. Thank you, Ahmed, for this very excellent presentation. And I would uh, ask you about the, if we detected perforation from the rupture of calcium, we can use the rotabrator before the dilatation. Uh, you will have experience for rotabrator for CTO, if heavy calcium uh, arteries? Yes, we, so we use around 4 to 5% of my CTO cases require uh, rotation lathrectomy. Uh, the problem arises when it's a balloon uncrossable lesion and you're, you're unable to deliver uh, your microcatheter distally to exchange over a rotational atherectomy wire. Now, one thing that usually helps on this occasion, and it's usually a tough situation, but one thing that usually helps after exhausting all your backup maneuvers, uh, trying to do a granadoplasty and so forth, is to wedge your microcatheter as far as it will go then try to maneuver your uh, prota wire, which is obviously not as versatile or not as talkable as conventional wires, across the lesion. And if you're able to follow the track created by your initial wire, then you can get your burn in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, for Thank this uh, great presentation. Uh, Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed, Professor Ahmed. There's just one question from Rami, so we'll be live. We'll be live. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this elegant lecture as usual. A question, but for the coils. 
انت حضرتك في طبعا نوعين الكويز اللي هو الازور والاي في 3 yes. ف ويتش تايب دو دو يو بريفير في طبعا الابيكارديا الكولاترال تاني حاجه السايز بتاع الكويل برضو تيك هوم مسج من الكلام اللي حضرتك قلته ان انا طالما ما فيش كويل يبقى انا ما اشتغلش على ابيكارديا الكولاترال ممكن استخدم فات امبولايزيشن بس ممكن يعني بالوقت ممكن تفيل فاحتاج بعدها كويل فانا لازم يكون عندي بريبيرد كويلز السؤال السايز بقى بتاع الكويل اللي هستخدمه او ايه الافيلبل سايزز والتايبس بتاع المايكرو كاستر اللي اقدر ادفانس فيها الكويل اللي عندي I'll be quick for the sake of time thank you excellent points regarding yes I don't think it's right if you don't have coils in your lab to go through epicardial collaterals Uh, the second thing, the neurovascular coils, the EB3 is a metronic type of coil, you used very frequently for neurovascular interventions, and they come in different shapes and forms. We're familiar with the spherical and helical forms, and what, you usually, what we usually aim for is the dimension of the coil, so you obviously have the length and width. We want the, lit to, the width to be approximately two times the diameter of the vessel. So if it's a one millimeter epicardial collateral, I would go for either a helical or a spherical coil with a diameter of two millimeters. Okay, thank you, Ahmed, thank for you. this uh, great uh, uh, presentation. Uh, now we'll move fast uh, because of time. We'll go to uh, Ramesh uh, Dagobati from uh, USA. Uh, uh, he will give us uh, uh, uncrossable uh, CTO lesions. Uh, what to do? God will help you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, uh, very much. I, I really appreciate that uh, uh, speak, uh, speaker as well. Dr. Elgindi gave a fantastic talk earlier. And I think the question about uh, Papyrus uh, versus the Grassmaster now completely, we have switched to Papyrus in the United States. At most centers, at least in our center, we have switched to Papyrus, which is easily deliverable. So I have no disclosures other than actually some of the slides I'm going to show off from Dr. Brilakis. Here is a 62-year-old man with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and stable angina. He had a cat in June 2020, which showed up blue RCA. He was sent home on uh, maximal medical therapy that uh, included Ramesh, beta blockers. Uh, Ramesh, can I say hi for you? It's Adel uh, Yes. Yeah. I'm just saying hi and thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope uh, you will be with us for the uh, next uh, couple of uh, lectures. And uh, we're happy to have you with us, uh, maybe physically next year. Hopefully, hopefully, I hope so too. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have uh, this patient who had uh, occluded RCA with the maximal medical therapy, but still, despite all that, he was having maximal medical therapy. Sorry, sorry about that. And uh, so, one minute. Here's the uh, occlusion in the mid uh, RCA, collateral from the left to uh, right PDA and uh, so you know unfortunately this is not uh, going to be an easy one and uh, whether it anti-grade or retrograde I think that is something that uh, somebody can discuss later but uh, we decided to actually have an uh, anti-grade approach in this patient and uh, you know you can see that it appears to be a short segment but uh, obviously you know there's some bridging collaterals. So in the anti-grade uh, crossing we tried to cross the lesion which was successful with the pilot 200 and, uh, but fine cross and the SAP 5 balloon uh, failed to cross the lesion here. So then you think about, uh, uh, this is a nice paper from Patel where uh, actually the prevalence and treatment of balloon uncrossable CTOs and what has been used. Uh, multiple balloons are used in about nearly 43% of the patients, micro catheters in about one third of the patients. And uh, as I think uh, somebody asked earlier, whether, uh, you know, uh, anti rotational atherectomy, if you cannot cross uh, even with a balloon to exchange, I would not like to lose my wire position if I cross the wire, in, like in this case. So um, most of the people, uh, actually, when it comes to atherectomy, we try to use uh, laser in such cases in about 10% of the patients. So approach to the balloon uncrossable CTOs are either modifying the lesion and uh, improving support, and sometimes you use both of them, right? And uh, so these are 10 different steps and how much uh, aggressive that you want to be, depending upon your comfort zone in uh, CTOs. Uh, what most of the people will always do is uh, trying to cross with a small balloon 
or uh, rupturing the balloon in the vessel called the granadoplasty is the first line and then trying to advance the microcatheter or uh, you know, seesaw technique or wire cutting puncture with the Gaia second or Gaia third, trying to modify the proximal cap, but the risk of uh, obviously perforations are there in those. And uh, obviously the, everyone is comfortable with guide catheter extensions and uh, anchor balloon strategies. And uh, also laser, I think is not uh, something that is very harmful to the patient that can be used. And ultimately, subintimal uh, uh, external crush or uh, distal anchor uh, is uh, fourth line. And ultimately, these external crush of uh, subintimal space can actually cause a thrombosis of the vessel. So I would uh, reserve that to the end. You know. So here in this patient, we are doing a granuloplasty or actually the term balloon-assisted microdissection is a proper uh, terminology that actually we should use. And uh, so that also uh, did not uh, help us. And then we tried uh, with the microcatheter uh, to see there are different microcatheters that you can use. Uh, uh, the big ones are Corsair and uh, 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 small ones are Caraval. They are being replaced by Mambas and Teleports. And uh, then there are, you know, obviously dual lumen for uh, which will be helpful for uh, Crusade or uh, Fine Duo for uh, side branch uh, access. And plaque modification, this is still sometimes uh, not available in most centers, uh, Tornus and Turnpike Gold, uh, to actually probably drill into the plaque and maybe modify it a little bit uh, more than uh, what the other microcatheters can do. Here, Corsair is, uh, here you cannot, uh, you can see it slightly, but it, uh, Corsair also is not going to cross in this lesion. So what next? You know, so, so then we go into either guide catheter extensions or long sheets, how to get more support larger eight French uh, 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 guide, guide catheters can be used or uh, guide liners. And uh, you, know, you can use buddy wire in the side branch and anchoring wire or anchoring side branch balloon uh, techniques to get your uh, uh, guide liners into much deeper position seeing then if you can cross the CTO with the balloon. So uh, that actually did not help in this patient as well. We tried with the guide catheter, guide liner and uh, uh, anchoring wire, but not uh, anchoring balloon. But uh, then we went with uh, laser, and uh, you know, uh, laser advantage is no need to change the wire. Even if the laser does not cross, we believe that it modifies the lesion. You use a 0.9 millimeter laser, uh, delivering about 30 to 80 millijoules per square millimeter at a frequency of 25 to 80. So I normally just uh, remember 40-40. Uh, you know, I, that's what I do in most patients, unless then I go to 40-80 or 80, 80, which is the highest energy that you can deliver. So uh, uh, I don't think there's any harm uh, doing it in saline, but uh, you can also use contrast. And obviously with contrast, there's a slight uh, higher chances of dissections and perforations. And contrast. And I think as Dr. Elgin mentioned, uh, you can use uh, orbital atherectomy or uh, in the United States, or rotation atherectomy once you're comfortably uh, able to exchange the wires uh, with the microcatheter with either the wiper wire or the rotor uh, wire. So th then the final thing is actually in these people, I was able to cross with the laser, we were able to do multiple balloon inflations and then able to deliver the stents. But if you're not, you can actually go and uh, either uh, uh, subintimal uh, wire technique and then uh, uh, scratch and go or balloon assisted uh, subintimal entry, the base technique. And uh, these are the ones that you have to be uh, slightly careful as you can actually cause more uh, uh, perforations can happen in these situations. So here you could see that actually there is a subintimal wire uh, that actually can scratch and go and a second wire in the subintimal space and trying to cross that. And then using a balloon in that uh, subintimal distal anchoring, uh, uh, the another balloon was able to cross here in the through through the original wire of the pilot uh, 200, and uh, then actually it is much easier. You can exchange and you can inflate balloons. And as I said, you know, for us in our patient at least, uh, we were able to do it just with uh, a. Uh, a laser and uh, then uh, uh, multiple balloon inflations and uh, gradually increasing from 1.0 to 3.0 and non-compliant balloons as well. And uh, then uh, finally uh, successful stent placement. 
So all these techniques uh, have to be used. One has to be much more uh, obviously knowledgeable about uh, uh, the first line, uh, which is granadoplasty. The second one is uh, anchoring balloon or uh, anchoring wire with the guide extensions. And obviously third, would, in my recommendation would be laser. And uh, then I think uh, if you're uh, not successful with that, the fourth line and it will be a side uh, uh, subintimal tracking with the wire and uh, anchoring the, the, uh, with the balloon in the subintimal space. Uh, and then I think uh, with that, you should be able to advance your balloon over the uh, uncrossable uh, lesion uh, wi wire, which was there in the original true lumen of the CTO. With that, I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? OK, I have a question from Gindi. Ramesh, thank you very much for one case showing all the sort of accelerated way we tackle better crossable lesions. My question to you, if you in the U.S., obviously, there's a, the use of ADR is slightly higher than what we do in this side of the world, including Europe. Uh, yeah. When would you consider just going around the calcium with that second balloon in? And if I remember the diagnostic angio, there seemed to be a good uh, re-entry zone just prior to the bifurcation. So would you have considered just ADR, re-entry, a stingray, re-entry, and uh, stenting or going around the calcium? Yeah, so actually, that's a very good question. Initially, I think um, uh, still our ADR usage is much higher than the rest of the world. Uh, but in our own institution and my personal experience, the e ADR is coming down a little bit and we are trying definitely to be within the true lumen using more Gaia wires or a Pilot 200s and a bit staying in the true lumen and trying to uh, either, uh, uh, get either laser or somehow uh, get back into rather than the ADR. And, so definitely, you know, my personal experience is uh, changing a little bit more than uh, uh, truly uh, using uh, ADRs and all the patients as we did earlier. Thank you. Thank you. And now we can go to the next speaker, Professor Dr. Amr Kamal. Uh, tips you. and the tricks on Dr. Amr Al uh, Hadidi. Hadidi sorry, and, uh, <laughs> Dr. Amr Al Hadidi. Tips and the trips in uh, retrograde. Amr Kamal fil Bahr. Cardiac collateral. Dr. Amr, fi fatra, an fikra mis basita farad nafsu ka expert fil C to O integrate or retrograde. الرحلة بتاعتك بقى في 2014 لما كنت بتسافر كل شوية أسبوعين في حتة تاخد كورس معين في السي تو أو بحد إيه؟ لا 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 خالص هو بيركز جدا في القصة دي من 2014 لحد ما واحد بقى ون اوف باينير اوف سي تو أو إن إيجيبت يعني فنشوف ريترو جريد سي تو أو ستيب باي ستيب Thank you, uh, Ahmed and uh, Amr, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be with my uh, professors and colleagues. Uh, okay, so to remove the, uh, the face mask, uh, the, this is much better. Um, uh, very important to have uh, the steps when you are doing retrograde. You need uh, to analyze the collaterals. Also, you need to, uh, to see the, what to do with the uh, microcaster passage and to know how to, how to do reverse card and how to externalize the wire. So, just quick uh, points from Manuel Berlakis uh, that he gave us uh, a no ad hoc CTO procedure. You need the time to study your angiogram and CT angio, reduce the contrast and check viability and need to talk to the patient and the family. And uh, this all we know about the dual injections and you need to study well the CTO uh, segment and how to see the proximal cap, uh, ambiguity and lesion length and the quality of these vessels and the collaterals. Uh, also, uh, uh, as you see here from the, uh, this figure that you'll see that the proximal vessel is very important, it is tortuous or not, and the ambiguous cap or clear, tapered or blunt cap, and if there is any side branches before the occlusion and the calcification inside. Also the lesion lens is very important and the quality of the distal vessel and the bifurcation, and you need to study well the collaterals. 
You have, as we saw uh, today and yesterday, that we uh, worked on the, uh, some of the septal collaterals, bypass graft as today with Mohanad uh, live transmission and also the epicardial one. Uh, definitely the size of these collaterals is very important as the sizing of these collaterals is small or bigger collaterals. Uh, tortuosity, the angle and location of entry. So all we know the Japanese CTO score that we, all we know that how is the, the difficulty to, uh, of this uh, uh, case uh, according to different parameters. I will not go, I will go just uh, fa fast to see what to do in my case. 55 years old man. Um, in mild effort in the last six months. So we need to do uh, dobutamine stress echo to, uh, to see the viability. This is very important message. And um, definitely this patient had a viable reversible inferior wall. Does not move. Okay. Next. Next. Alhamdulillah. Okay, uh, as you see this um, scenario, uh, you need to, when you are doing a CTO, you need to have a good uh, evidence of viability because sometimes this uh, uh, CTO segment uh, supplies a, a scar myocardium. So you need to be sure that the, ba the patient will benefit from this uh, scenario. Uh, next, please. Uh, I think this uh, is not working from here. Can you work it from there? Yalla? Good. The size of the reversible ischemia is mild or moderate or moderate or the area of ischemia is itself. This reversible ischemia is in the area of the whole? Is this size of the reversible ischemia? Yes, definitely. The size of ischemia and more than 10% is this a very huge uh, ischemia. So I think, again, do you have a good discussion on this before, uh, Ahmed? Uh, we have a discussion about the size of viabilities for the... Do you recommend this uh, a size, a special size for the... Which case do you need to do CTO for this area? If you have a reversible myocardial ischemia on this vitamin stress echo, what do you think? Or stress talium? So while the, while the slides are up, I think we need to remember that the solid data out there for CTO PCI is symptomatic benefit. So my first, second, and third indications for taking a patient into the cath lab is because of symptoms. We also need to remember that symptoms are frequently not your classic angina in patients with CTO PCI, uh, with CTOs, around 50% of them report poor exercise tolerance and fatigue rather than classic angina. Um, there is no data so far to support CTO PCI in patients for the purpose of um, preventing further LV dysfunction, and definitely there's no data for mortality. So I would, I would really want to have a symptomatic patient to uh, start discussing whether uh, he would benefit from the, he or she would benefit from the procedure. The function is that if you have a CTO for red coronary, and you have a CTO function, you have a CTO below 40%. And there is a lesion, but moderate lesion, mild or moderate lesion in the lift system. Do you think I can open the red coronary to function? I know that the theory is good, but for a right coronary artery alone to be the reason, unless there is a scar with LV remodeling, to be the cause for ischemic cardiomyopathy is very unlikely. Yeah. So if this were part of a complete revascularization for a patient with multivessel disease and an RCA CTO, then the answer is absolutely yes. I would tackle the RCA either during the same session or differently. Yeah, not uh, so, though, as a part of multivessel disease, yes. not alone. Um, that, that would be a very solid indication, yes. But yeah. otherwise, for isolated CTOs, I think uh, the main reason or the main driver should be symptomatic uh, benefit. Now, viability is a totally different issue, but I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Amr, who does not have his slides up and running yet. Let me try okay. to look at it. Dr. Amr, I'm to change them in...
من انتي جريد ريتو جريد بيبقى له تايم ولا موضوع اسكليشن الواير خلصت اسكليشن بتعمل انتي ريتو جريد على طول ولا ايه ال ذيس از ا فيري جود كويشنز اند تيل ناو ذير از نو انسر فور ذيس كويشن بت يو نو ذات يو هاف سام بوينتس ذات يو هاف وين يو ار وركينج انتي جريد وين تو ستوب ذيس از موست امبورتنت بيكوز سام تايم اف يو هاف نو بروجريس Don't insist to go subentimal again and again, and you have no end. Especially if you are affecting the distal retrograde uh, feeling. Sometimes when you're weak, you see a subentimal hematoma, a big subentimal hematoma, it will uh, close or allow you to fail with anti or retrograde even with, with this big hematoma. So uh, sometimes you try, and if you have a progress, you can uh, do anti-grade wire escalation. Or ADR, and you can have the the the, the opportunity to succeed uh, anti-grade. Sometimes it can take for you after 15 minutes. Okay, I will not succeed to go anti-grade, so I go shift. Sometimes you have a more than half an hour. You can try to, and but sometimes you are always uh, uh, who are doing uh, retrograde. Always in mind, you have. The uh, I want to be when to go retrograde. So, I mean, when you are working retrograde, it's easy to go fast. The decision will be faster. Oh, the problem I is mean. when you are not doing a retrograde, so you will insist on anti-grade. When you insist on anti-grade, you will fail, and then you will you need to stop because so you need to do another trial, maybe four weeks or six weeks. I think we come back. Okay. So, uh, sorry for this delay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think we can go for the next speaker. And then uh, we'll check. Let's take just your discussion, like an expert in CTO. I mean, you. Then I want the film. I want the film. We want to know what the story is. But the film is not going to come. Yes. I think uh, uh, we go. Alexander uh, Ibrahim. No, I think uh, Mohanad is ready. Mohanad, do you hear us? Yes, I can. Because we have uh, some issue in the video. Okay, I think it's working now. I don't know if it's working. But uh, be ready because uh, if it's not working, so we'll go for, uh, for you to start your... Uh... Okay, we are ready? Can, ready. You, can you go for full screen? Okay, so uh, how to study this uh, uh, CTO segment in this, uh, this patient had a CTO RCA, as you see, and uh, definitely when you are injecting first the LED, you will see these are good uh, collaterals coming uh, retrograde from uh, these uh, epicardial collaterals. Can you see the epicardial collaterals coming from the diagonal? It's not coming from the LED, it's, as you see. You will see that the, uh, the, the, I will see now after the next picture, you will see the uh, collateral, next please. Oh, Anna Maya, that's okay. So if you need to study this uh, uh, collateral, if you look for the red color, you will see where is the uh, epicardial collateral coming from the diagonal and going to the distal RCA. Uh, definitely this is an ambiguous cap as you see in the uh, in the RCA occlusion with calcification and good distal runoff at the bifurcation, very tortuous epicardial collaterals and lesion lengths are more than 20. So uh, the Japanese GCTO score is uh, three, so it's a very difficult case. So you know, this is all known uh, hybrid algorithm for CTO PCI, um, and it was uh, how to do uh, anti or retro, and then will decision try first anti grade. And then if uh, our escalation, if failed, we go retrograde. So these are the uh, CTO PCI uh, procedural approach uh, when you are doing uh, anti-grade or retrograde wire escalation or uh, reverse car. Uh, so the, one of the most important tricks, as mentioned with uh, Ramesh today, is using anchoring balloon. So when using an anchoring balloon, you can use the RV branch 
to fix the guiding uh, because it's, sometimes it's very difficult to go with a microcaster. It's very difficult to go with any uh, with balloon or anything. So uh, we are using a, a fine cross microcaster, it's a smaller uh, microcaster, and then we use uh, wire escalation. You first we are using a uh, fielder and Gaia second. As you see here for the tip on the, on the right side, you'll see that the tip of the Gaia is outside uh, sub space. So uh, it's definitely you need to stop because if you cross again more, you will go beyond the cracks and it will cause a lot of problems. So this is very important aspect to, be, to do before passing a collateral. You need first the strategy. Safety first, check ACT. And the uh, important is the mental force. So you need to slow down your procedure and be aware of complications and start with super selective injections. So uh, in, to analyze this collateral, we give uh, uh, a uh, microcaster injection, tip injection, through the Corsair microcaster, as you see at the arrow, yellow arrow at the right. And you'll see this is diagonal. It gives uh, the collaterals, the picardial collaterals to the uh, RCA. Uh, this is uh, the pyramid that Dr. Adel like uh, and how to uh, do, uh, when to do uh, retrograde. So you need to start first as a beginner with a septal. And today, Mohan uh, tell us that we can start with a vein graft. And so, but definitely the septal can afford the, uh, the crossing of these uh, uh, retrograde wires. And if you are uh, uh, through control tracking, Definitely the septal surfing is another step that you need more expertise to go. And if you have an experience, it will start first with easy epicardial collaterals. And then you can use, if you are more experts, you can use a complex epicardial and the uh, easy epicardial fast uh, rotation. Uh, so uh, we'll do, and this, uh, you, know, you need to know why this pyramid, because you know if you need to select your collaterals. You know the difference between the septal and the epicardial and the bypass graft. If you look for this uh, uh, table, you will see that the tortuosity and perforation risk are more with the epicardial collateral. So be cautious with the epicardial collaterals. Think uh, before you start, and you need to have your equipment behind the complications that can occur, and it will let you to do the case easily. So uh, the predictors of collateral failure, this is very important, that you have, if you have a larger size, Lack of tortuosity, it will be with success uh, in this case. So the uh, uh, G-channel score, this is a channel score for the successful wiring. If you have the bigger collateral size, the reverse bend is less than 90, uh, or the continuous bend this is more risky, and then we have the corkscrew, it's more difficult to cross. So the wires, we need to look for this diagram because if you look for the wires, for the septal wiring, Sion, Sion Black, Fielder XT, and Dr. Adel asked today about the use of Gladius for the uh, crossing or uh, retrograde, and also the Epicardial Su-03 and Sion Black and Fielder XTR. Well, these are the microcaster. You need to know that this septal crossing is better with a rotable microcaster if you have uh, Corsair, Turnpike, or uh, Turnpike LP. And if you have a bigger epicardial, you can use Turnpike Corsair Pro. If you have a smaller uh, epicardial collateral, you can use Fine Cross or Caravan. So we use in this case uh, a Corsair with Suho 03. If you look to the right side, you will see that this is the tip of the microcaster, and the wire now is coming from this uh, uh, microcaster through the epicardial, through the diagonal, through the epicardial. Look for the movement of the Suho 03. You need to, don't push and wait for the heartbeats to work. And then you will see now after sl slight push and don't go, as you see, pu don't push and go behind with the microcaster. This is very important to support the Soho Series 3 when you are going because it's a very fragile tip. So now we succeed to cross uh, destiny. So uh, you, you, uh, sometimes you can have a rotable microcaster. It will be very good like Corsair or turnpike, and don't, don't force the, uh, the, uh, the microcaster, especially and this uh, tortuous epicardial collateral. And when you look here, you will see that the tip of this, uh, uh, the anti-grade wire and the retrograde uh, wire coming from the retrograde microcaster. And so now we have the uh, control anti-grade or retrograde tracking. As you see, the reverse card technique, 
that you're using the balloon on the, pro uh, the proximal anti-grade wire. And then we try to go uh, after deflation of the balloon to go from the distal retrograde wire anti-grade. So this is uh, the, an ex a good example how to do the reverse car. So we try to use a smaller balloon first and we try to go uh, with the retrograde wire trying to catch the uh, true lumen. And we use a bigger balloon, we try also to go, but it was uh, difficult to cross. And then we try to uh, see the role of IVAS. Sometimes IVAS will be very helpful, definitely helpful if you are using IVAS uh, in uh, retrograde cases, very important to, uh, to adjust where is your, your retrograde wire in relation to the anti-grade wire. And this is a different scenario. Sometimes you have an intimal, intimal, or sub intimal, sub intimal, or the more uh, sub intimal and intimal retrograde. So you have the IVUS now on the anti grade wire, as you see, and we try to see what is going on. And this is uh, the IVUS picture. If you look at nine o'clock, you will see the ret retrograde wire seen uh, sub intimally in relation to that uh, anti grade wire. Sometimes it's very important to have the good guideliner extension wi guide wire uh, guide uh, casters that you can uh, push through this guide extension if you have uh, the retrograde wire uh, we're very good to go and catch the lumen of the uh, uh, guide uh, extension as you see we try to go inside we try to go back and then push and as you see here we could go uh, through the uh, the guide extension on, on the right on the right and on the right side you'll see now the left side sorry and you'll see that it will go inside the, the uh, guide extension and then you will do uh, uh, externalization using rg3 and then you uh, start to dilate at the side as this is as usual and we uh, stented this part and then we we'll try to uh, see what's from the retrograde don't inject anti-grade because this will cause a lot of uh, dissection and we try to cover the stents uh, all the way. And as you see here, with a good feeling of the uh, RCA. And with the most important thing is that uh, you need to do, if you have an eye vest, to assess the size of the stents and also how to optimize your result. Uh, and we'll uh, have a good uh, well opposition of the GC from the stent, the, from the distal to the proximal. And uh, with, uh, we need so sometimes so here you can need, you need a, a bigger a non-compliant uh, balloon uh, for also you have a, a good deployment uh, of the stent and this is uh, after uh, putting the stent and as you see here that the ostium so you have a good feeling of the RCA. And this is uh, very important to check the epicardial collaterals that is, has no injury, no perforation uh, before removing everything. Uh, and this is uh, the final result of the RCA. So uh, my take home message, very important to have a septal wiring is associated with higher success and lower rate of complications than the epicardial one. As we saw in the pyramid that the beginners and advanced retrograde operators should focus on septal wiring. Definitely is uh, more uh, safe than epicardial one. And you need to have new wire wires like, uh, it's not new now, but it's uh, wires that are like SU-03 uh, uh, that can go uh, with uh, some cautiously through these epicardial collaterals. And uh, you need to have uh, your uh, uh, equipment to avoid the complications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amr. Uh, I, I have a very simple question for you, sir. Uh, very demonstrative case. All what we need to know about retrograde mostly have been done with your case and how to manage every step uh, very wise. Uh, my question is, uh, from the start, you deal with the anchor balloon distally. Have we any conditions for the balloon that you use about the size of the balloon, about the length of the balloon, about the timing that you inflate the balloon while you are dealing as, a, as it is an anchor balloon? This is a very important question. Definitely, when you are using an anchoring balloon, you need to size the balloon according to the size of the branch because sometimes I, uh, it's a very risky to use a bigger balloon because it will cause uh, a perforation or uh, dissection. So the, the most important, the sizing first, then the timing. 
Sometimes you can uh, wait for a longer time if you have no ischemia, no changes, no ECG changes. So uh, in between, you are not, while you are not crossing or not using a pressure on the guiding, you can relieve this, uh, uh, deflate the balloon, and you can continue later according to the push, push or advancement of this uh, microcaster or balloon or long stance, whatever you want. The, my second question, sir, that uh, uh, if my retrograde approach after I deal an antigrade and then retrograde and also retrograde is failed, is there any time again to antigrade again? Yes, uh, definitely we, we, we can try uh, uh, ADR in this case, but uh, I think we have a, a very long segment, so now uh, it will be uh, difficult to recross. Uh, what do you think, Ahmed? Uh, if you have, if you failed uh, uh, after we cross from <coughs> anti to retro and we try to go ADR, do you think ADR will be helpful in this scenario after going in the distal near the cracks? I think uh, it's an excellent question and excellent comment. Um, I think the first thing to understand is what is the mode of failure? And if the mode of failure is related to failure to cross the septal collateral, the second question would be, is another septal? Uh, can we, is there an epicardial channel that we can use? Is the failure because of a difficult reverse cut? And we've seen one of the ways we can deal, or actually more than one way, change the site of re-entry, use a bigger balloon. Sometimes we, we resort to a cutting balloon even when we're unable to get both wires in the same compartment and we want to create connection planes. Yeah. Um, and the third thing would be, if it's not working and I am crossed retrograde, can I use the retrograde wire as a marker? So now you shift to anti-grade wire escalation. On this particular occasion, ADR is not a recommended approach because uh, the, the CTO, the distal cap, is right at the bifurcation, so any ADR technique would inevitably lead to losing the PLA. Now, if all those fail and you don't really have an ADR option, uh, this is the time where you need to consider stopping and if you want to fail in style, this is where an investment procedure can yeah. come in hand. This so is very important. You would uh, 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 Rami, uh, Rami, do you want what? to ask, to tell something? Rami? No. Oh, okay. What do you think? If you have this uh, and you stop, or you want to change the, the approach, or what do you want? Okay. As I said, Dr. Ahmed, can I say, first thing to know, the failure, حصل ليه يعني انا فيلد انتي جريد اول مره ليه هل لان الفيلير تو باس الواير وتاني حاجه ان انا فيلد ريترو جريد ليه فيلد ريترو جريد علشان المايكرو كاستر ما عدتش عشان السبتال مش كبير تراي انذر سبتال تراي ابيكارديال تراي انذر واي ثم بعد كده لو فيلد برضو ممكن لو فيلد ريترو جريد ارجع انتي جريد تاني ببط نوت از سيم استراتيجي ممكن اغير الاستراتيجي لو معايا ستنجري اقدر اعمل دايسكشن ري انتري بريبير فور انذر سيشن ويز انذر اكويبمنت بس فيلد انتي جريد وبعدين فيلد ريترو جريد ده ما يمنعش ان انا احاول انتي جريد تاني بس ابقى نظر اكويبمنت وابقى نظر استراتيجي وابقى عارف المود اوف فيلير بتاعي ايه. وحاولت اشرب ماي فيلد از باي مثلا نوت باس ذا سيبت البرانش وي كان بترايل انذر سيبت البرانش ان ذا سيم سيشن اور وي ويتنج فور انذر سيشن. اه يا اتس ا جود اوبشن ديفينتلي بس ذا سيبت واز نوت سو جود ان ذيس اف يو هاف ميني سيبت البرانش اند وي ترايل فيلد ان وان كان بي ترايل ذا سيم سيشن. Or not, uh, we, we can try according to the time. Of course, the, the phone is better than the, to stop because uh, we have a lot of complications, maybe. So, دايما ما بيبقاش سبتال واحد هو المدي كولاترال هو بيبقى فيه سبتال وفي انذر سبتال مدي لو انا السبت الاولاني تختار السبت اللي هتشتغل عليه على اقل ترشواسته واكبر دايمتر ومور ستريت والاندوسيليم بتاعه بيبقى سيك شويه هتاخد وقت لحد ما تفطر وفيلد اه ممكن اتراي انذر سبتال او لو في ابيكارديال اتراي لو ما فيش انذر سبتال او ما فيش ابيكارديال اكيد هبوستبون البروسيدور واتراي في انذر سيشن 
انا قلت ان انت تبص طول احسن فعلا ثانك يو ثانك يو بيكوز اوف تايم بيكوز اوف تايم ثانك يو اي وود لايك تو جو فاست بيكوز وي ار ريدي فور ذا لايف سو جو ويز مهند فيرست and we thank you mohanad for this uh, great uh, case uh, today that you did live from uh, your cath lab uh, and i'm very happy to have the good result with your case uh, that show us how to use a retrograde uh, vein graft to the uh, uh, cto uh, rca so thank you mohanad and you can give you the talk now thank you i'm just going to share my slides Can you see my slides? Yes. And can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> so the task I was given to talk about was the CTO angiogram, the acquisition and planning. And I think Kamer has uh, touched on some of the, the aspect of this. Um, I work in Newcastle, as you've seen, and uh, thank you for, for the invitation and for involvement in this great meeting. These are my conf conflict of interest. As you know that the pyramid of PCI complexity starts from the physiological assessment, similar thing goes all the way up to the CTO PCI. Of course, in order to succeed, you really have to have the build up the skill and work with colleagues and learn from everybody to be able to reach that stage. Um, and by practicing more and more with colleagues, you get to that stage easily. Uh, fact is that CTOs are, are present in up to about 30% of cases, and the fact that that used to influence the success of CTO treatment, depending on multiple things from the age of the occlusion, the length, the morphology, calcification, etc., the distal flow. And historically, up to about a few years ago, it used to be less than 70%, because the, we used to do it in one way and one way only. The anatomy decided whether you do it or not. You look at the angiogram, if you're not happy, you think it's going to be difficult, you don't do it. You either send them for surgery or do um, uh, treat them medically. And it used to be only anti-grade wiring. That was the only strategy. On top of that, the wires were not as sophisticated or as, as good. They used to be prolonged, frequent failures, and as you said, the success rate is probably about 60 to 70 percent only. Um, then the revolution has happened. The Japanese, our colleagues from Japan, have taken that forward and then um, other from Europe and America, and then we became quite different in a, um, achieving different outcome. So we've learned a lot. We rebooted our skills. We've learned many, many new skills. And then we learned that the anatomy serves to blend the strategy, not to turn down cases. And then technically you say nothing is impossible, which is true. And this is not being said in a, in a kind of uh, flippant way, because there are lots of things you can do nowadays. And we have lots of equipment. And of course, you learn to become comfortable being uncomfortable. In the old days, if you dissect the artery, you stop because you were worried about uh, a later effects. So nowadays, we dissect the artery on purpose and we use the in subintimal space. So really, how do we, in order to succeed uh, with the CTO, the hybrid approach became the mainstay of doing what we do. And basically, what it is, is it tells you that the clinical need, not the anatomy that determines revascularization, i.e., if somebody needed to be done for their CTO, you do it. It's not how it looks. The anatomy will only help you to guide the initial strategy. It's not to decide whether to do it or not. Subintimal space became the common. We use it frequently, whether anti-grade or retrograde. And because of this hybrid approach and the different way of dealing with these arteries, you switch. Of course, you build the experience and you see other operators and you learn from each other. And you'll be able to know when to switch and when uh, to, to change your strategy and what you do. But you go in with one strategy, being prepared to switch it and change it. Of course, the hybrid approach comes anti-grade, retrograde, or the dissection, re-entry, anti-grade or retrograde, as you could see here. And with this diagram here, it tells you it's a dynamic thing. You could change the questions were asked a little bit earlier when Amr was giving the talk. Do you go back and do anti-grade? Do you stop? What do you do? Of course, all the clinical judgment, depending on how much dye, how much x-ray, etc. But yes, sometimes you fail anti-grade, you try retrograde, it's difficult to go and try again anti-grade if the time and the dye and etc. is allowing you. It's a dynamic, continuous uh, action to be able to, uh, to achieve success. And as you can see, it is a complicated way until you, you master it. So in order to know it or to be successful in dealing with CTOs, you really need to know what you are looking for and what you look for and assess it to be able to uh, devise a, a, a strategy. And of course, some of you might have read this, this book, which is The Art of War. 
It says, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. But if you know yourself, not the enemy, there will be, for every victory gain, you will have some defeat. And if you don't know either, then you will succumb to in every battle, which means really you need to know what you are dealing with. And that's the anatomy of the CTO and the angiogram. That's where the angiogram comes in. So really to achieve this, I put these kind of in a, uh, multiple things. The first thing is to start no magnification because you want to see all the coronary anatomy. You want to see the whole heart or everything. And you need to have a dual injection. You start with the retrograde first and let it run and fill the collaterals. And once the collaterals are full, that's when you inject uh, antigradely. You need long runs. You need to stay on the cine until the contrast is washed out. And I put again no panning, what's none whatsoever because that confuses the anatomy and makes it very difficult. This is really important. And of course, you could review other, because if there's a CTO and somebody has had an angiogram a few years ago, you could learn the anatomy and you could look at the previous angiogram, particularly in patient post uh, cabbage. The dual injection, as we said, is really essential. You can't do it without. And optimally image the lesion, the distal vessel and the collateral channel. This is all comes to tell you that then the panning and what you look for is, is important. And here are a couple examples of uh, this is not running. Uh, let me just see if I could run it here. So this is just a, a simple example, a bit from some a patient referred to me. And you could see that there are collaterals referred to me for the CTO of the right. But looking at the angiogram here on the left or on the right, really you can't see the RCA very well. All what the concentration was for the operator just to look at the LAD and the lima. But in reality, what you want to do is you want to look at the, the whole thing you look at the collateral and the cross filling from the uh, from that side. Apology, this doesn't seem to be running properly. I stop this. It might. Anyway, so we got another case here, and it's the same one. When they were asking the question, you could see that if the whole heart is in picture, it's no magnification. You inject and let it run long. At least now you're able to appreciate the septal collateral, the distal vessel, and what you are looking for. For. This is the case I showed this morning, again, set up. The heart is in the middle, off mag, and I only start with the retrograde, and when the retrograde fills all the way to the distal cab, that's when I inject antigradely. That helps me to decide the length of the lesion, the cab, the, the collaterals, etc. So, and when you do the angiogram, you really need to spend time studying it, yeah, the diagnostic, because you want to look for all the things that kind of I'm going to mention in a minute. And if you're stuck and you're not 100 percent sure, there's a lot of experienced operator. I get lots of text messages or like WhatsApp messages sending me an angiogram or um, a question. What do you think? How what do we do that? And it's very easy nowadays with colleagues around the world to be able to communicate with them with that way. So don't be afraid to ask, because sometimes little ideas come from you know, experience and give, makes life very easy for you. Of course, in order to do a good angiogram, you need to, to choose the optimal projection. And I'm not going to go through this because all of you are you know, experienced and you know which one to see the right, which one to see the LAD, and which one to, to look at the circumflex. Um, and for the angiographic analysis, once you've seen that, here we go. Sorry, my, my phone is not. Uh, sorry. Adam, can I phone you back in a minute? Okay, thanks. Bye bye. Sorry about that. Um, so here we've taken bilateral injection. I stopped it because you could run with the, with the image and stop it wherever you want. You could study the collaterals and study the, the connections. So Amar has just shown this. What do you look for? You look at the proximal cap. You look at the lesion length or the occlusion length. You look at the quality of the distal vessel and the collaterals. All this together helps you to decide, am I going to go anti-grade? Am I going to go anti-grade dissection re-entry? I'm going to go retrograde, retrograde dissection re-entry. So, and of course, these are the other stuff that you look for, the length, the calcification, the torsuosity, the proximal cab, and it has been any previous failure, which is the JCTO score, basically. And the higher the score, of course, the, um, the, the more difficult it is and the more unlikely that the anti-grade wire escalation will, will uh, succeed. And you have to start thinking about the hybrid approach, the retrograde, dissection, re-entry, etc. So in the proximal cab, what you want to do is you want to see is it clear or not? 
how is the proximal vessel? Is it tortuous or not? If the, um, the, the cab is clear, easy, you could find the stiff wire to enter it. If it's not clear, very difficult, you could run into trouble. There are ways of overcoming the ambiguity. I won't go into that because that's not, not the aim of this. Whether it's tapered or blunt, a blunt uh, proximal cap could be difficult to penetrate, as you, everybody will know. And you might need some other ways of, of dealing with it to be able to penetrate it. The presence of side branches could change the way you approach it dramatically. Because intuitively, when you have resistance, the wire is going to choose the least uh, resistant path, and that's usually a side branch. Again, ways of overcoming this by putting a balloon block in the branch or putting an IVAS to see where you direct your wire, etc. And of course, the presence of calcification is important because calcium is the enemy of angioplasty, basically. Here's a couple examples. This is the you could see that on the right side that's playing right now. The cab is clear, and you could see it here. You, you know what to do with your uh, way to direct your wire and to penetrate even a stiff wire. If you look at the left one, it's really very difficult to know where the cab is, and there are side branches. So, you know, if you take a stiff wire to try to go through this uh, proximal cab, it could be dangerous, which may require you to use other techniques like the base or balloon assisted sub interval entry or scratch and go with a stiff wire or the go retrograde. The lesion length is important because if it is more than 20 millimeter, then the chances of succeeding anti are much less. It's never zero because it's always worth a try. Sometimes you find micro channel, particularly with the current crop of wires that we have and the experience we built, sometimes you'll be surprised. But if the course is ambiguous or if unambiguous that you'll be able to tell, and if there are side branches and the calcification and angulation. Quite often nowadays, people are using CT coronary angiogram to help with this anatomical assessment. But the bilateral injection and the making sure no panning helps you to decide the length of the lesion and other characteristics. And what about the distal vessel? It is important because that also helps you to decide do I go into grade dissection re-entry or do I have to have another uh, approach? If you have a decent distal vessel and a long lesion, you could dissect because you could re-enter in that decent distal vessel. But if it's at the bifurcation and the artery reconstitute there, you have to be careful because you will lose one of the branches if you dissect and try to re-enter. The presence of bypass graft insertion, again, can be very difficult because, again, the wire will continue to choose the least resistant and go into the vein graft. And that could be troublesome. What about the collateral? Of course, here's if you look at the small angiogram on the left, the, the, the artery constitute at the bifurcation, and it's not really very clear. If you try to go into grade dissection re-entry, you will lose one of these two. So basically, this will be a retrograde approach. In here, the distal vessel is really diseased. Apologies, this is supposed to blame, but it's not. The distal vessel is quite diseased, and if you think you're going to re-enter there, it could be a nightmare. But you could see that there's a nice connection from the circumflex. Epicardial, so it needs experience to deal with this, but it can be used, and this is where you go uh, retrograde. Again, these are supposed to be playing, and I'm not sure why not. Um, anyway, I'll skip these. Again, the collateral type, I mentioned them this morning, septal, epicardial, vein graft, and lima. This, this vein graft are the safest and the easiest one to deal with really helpful and very good to start with just to get used to the equipment and how you handle the micro catheter the the wires etc septals come next and they are safe but they could be troublesome if you you don't handle them with respect it because really for experienced operators until you build a good experience and this was mentioned by ahmed and amr because they could be troublesome and lima because of the length of the the lima and the tortuosity it could lead to a lot of ischemia and also because it's long, you could use a guideline obviously, but that can be troublesome. What about the collaterals? And this is, there are a few things you need to look at. Um, the size of them, and uh, you know, you'll know about the Werner classification from zero to, to two. Of course, there's number three, which is the Aaron Grantham one. Um, and then you look at the ang angle of con uh, connection and where also the collateral connects to the, to the artery. If it's very close to the distal cab, it could be very difficult. Um, and also the, the angulation of entry. You need to study that frame by frame to be able to see where, where these come off and connect. And often sometimes, which I usually do frequently if I can't decide, you could switch the background of the angiogram from being black to white, uh, sorry, from being white to black, and you see the artery in white, and it gives you a little bit better uh, visibility and uh, for better assessment. And here are the, the classification I was telling you. 
When you look at these, of course, you know, you don't plan, you do it very slowly. And you find out that you could pick lots of these um, collaterals. The question was asked, if I used one and it didn't work, can I use another one? Of course you can. And this is basically, you could either surfing, depending on your experience, or if you're not sure, you could take the microcatheter into the septal and inject some dye and, and decide the connection and the course of this uh, epicardial, or uh, this collateral. As for the epicardial, they are really, um, you know, could be very difficult, and not all of them are suitable or favorable. If you look at the top one, yes, epicardial has to be handled carefully and gently, but it's not very tortuous. But nonetheless, once you've done quite a few of these, you know that control of the wire is quite difficult because the heart is contracting and with the movement, control of the wire can be troublesome or difficult. But the current wires, particularly the SOHE 3, are very, very helpful in that. If you look at the bottom one, yes, it connects, but that is no, no chance that this will be suitable for you to cross. Of course, you could be surprised sometimes <clears throat> and the, the wire will go through. But often with these kind of tortuosity, you get a concertina effect. So delivering the microcatheter can be uh, very difficult. And on top of that, the mo motion of the heart as well as the contraction makes it very difficult. Uh, Mohanad, uh, we have live transmission waiting. So uh, can we, can we have uh, just uh, two minutes or something? Okay. Yeah, yes. Retrograde through venograph, you've seen it this morning, so I won't dwell too much on it. And to, to summarize quickly, the optimal CTO angiography and systemic evaluation is really important. It's imperative for the efficacy, efficiency, and safety and success. Dual injection, no panning, um, assess it and evaluate it quickly. And you could see the assessment, um, as I said, changing the background, gives you a very good um, uh, images. And really a good angiogram followed by precise and accurate comprehensive analysis is the key to success. And with this, I say thank you. Again, just a, a quick uh, summary. Dual injection, no magnification, no banning, and long runs. And that will hopefully will give you all the information you need. And uh, I thank you very much. I'm happy to answer a question unless you want to go straight to the, uh, to the transmission. I like this uh, 2020 uh, syringe. Very great uh, presentation, uh, Mohanad. to lose the masks a bit.